lined up good. And I think we got it. There it is. <laughs> well, when you took that break, Brian, you mentioned that you had some special guests once that you oh, met, yeah. met the. Well, we the we were with the one thirty at the time. Um, we were supporting the Antarctic out of Christchurch, and so it's the astronauts. The Navy was the recovery for the like the Mercury astronauts, primarily recovery. But the Air Force, we trained crews, and we were all over the world. And I ended up on Ascension, which I'd been to a couple of times. And we covered between South America and Africa. And then we had them in Mauritius, we had them in Singapore, we had... Um, but anyway, I didn't, I'd didn't. i been to Thule, Greenland a few times, and I didn't want to go to Antarctica. I had a choice of either going with the astronaut recovery or that. So I volunteered, and we were at a train. So there's another guy too. We did most of it, um, and then at the last minute, then we'd bring in the, the guys that would, you know, take the other airplanes. So I was down to Eglin there in Florida for probably a month, and we'd take the um, Air Force paramedics out. And they'd take a capsule, a dummy capsule, out a couple hundred miles out. We'd go find it, and I'd dress these guys, put their scuba gear and shoots and stuff on them, and they'd jump out and. Uh, and I'd sit in the tailgate of the back of the truck, the 130. You had the flotation collar that went around it. Two small, little like one man or two man rafts. And that'd be tools and a medical kit and stuff, food, you know. Because if they went down in the South Atlantic, you know, it'd take a while for somebody to get to them. And uh, so they'd, we'd throw that out at 150 feet above the deck. And you'd try to wrap it around, like, here's the capsule. And the wind is it'd wrap it. They put it, the two small ones, the capsule, and then the other two, and they're tied together so they'd wrap right around. And then the then you drop your paramedics, and those guys were great. They were experts in nine fields, and you know they were paramedics, mechanics, parachute guys, anything. A great bunch. So we did this for a while and really got it down. You know they mark spots like you do in a, in a side window and. Although they, they guided you in. I was on hot mic, I'd be on hot mic in the back, and they'd be looking out, seeing the thing. They'd the capsule the, in yeah, the water? they'd see the capsule in the water because they'd nod their head one way, and you'd go, you know, one degree left, or two degrees right, you know, this stuff. And then they'd jump just like that. But, um, and it didn't make any difference what the wind was doing. We went out one night, and it was, them seas had to be 10 feet high and blowing the top right off them, middle of the night. And we went up to 20,000 feet, and I'd throw a couple of million candle powers out the back end, mm. and flares, you know, and then mm. we'd go back down. And, but then the astronaut would show up, and so we flew to Houston twice. I spent uh, a week at two different times out in Houston. And we went out there because they had different equipment, and they also wanted to see what was gonna, who was going to pick them up, <laughs> you know. I mean, if they got in trouble, it was a, you know, and see what was going on. So they get on the plane, and it was funny, because all I had was a stack of wood pallets with a piece of plywood on it, and the, the flight mech ran a couple of power cords out to this so they could have, they call it a Sarah outfit, search and, search and locator deal anyway. And they were just improving on this to find the capsule. This is back in the early 60s, you know, so it was sort of primitive. So they're on the plane, I never gave it a thought. You meet them and you're working with them and they'd go out and fly with us and they'd see what I was doing, you know, putting the cap and putting the thing out and they were offering advice or whatever, you know, what it was like. And, the scuba guys, so we're all the whole bunch, you all work together. The search and rescue team? No, this is the astronauts. Oh, the astronauts themselves? Yeah. Now, they would fly, they, well, they were in with us. We'd fly out to Houston, and what is it? I don't know what is it, bird field? But anyway, the astronauts fly out. And just spend like a week or, you know, four or five days, whatever it would be at the time. And we'd go out and they'd make changes, you know, and back in and they're back out. And there was always four or five of them or three or four of them on the plane with us just. And uh, there was what? that original eight or ten astronauts. Do you recall were, any of their names? No. Well, whoever was on the Mercury missions, you know. And because that's who was, that's who the ones were. And um, so that was, I wish they had gotten some autographs or something. But there again, you do stuff like this, and it's your job. Mm -hmm. Never gave it a thought that it was anything that was other than a job. No, they were flying on the plane with you yeah. to get to help you get acquainted with how to rescue them? 
Right. Yeah, and just to see and change, you know, it was probably to reassure them too, you know, that because um, this, like I said, the Navy had a primarily was in the Pacific, and then they had another. Um, they had an alternate route over there north of the Canaries, like between the Canaries and the Azores, someplace in that area. If I remember right, I've seen. But there were any place in the world we had a C-130 that could reach them within four hours. Oh, okay. Any place, and our planes over by like Singapore or Hong Kong or. But we had one in Chile, um, and I don't know if we might have had one out. They probably had, well, wherever, wherever the, you know, they went around. And so when they were, there was maybe for a while that we were real high alert. We sat right in the airplanes with the G, with the thing too, and everything ready to go. And we tanked and we put an extra 26,000 pounds of fuel on board. So we could, we were carrying like 90,000 pounds of fuel, so we could fly for a day and a half, you know. Because if you found them and you dropped it, <coughs> you'd stay on station, you know, to, but it was all contingency. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we never had to use it. They always come down, the Navy picked them up, you know, it was, that was great. So but, the, what you were doing, you'd, um, in the event they couldn't be picked up because of rough seas or something, you would... No, we were, we were there, say they came down off the coast of Argentina. Okay. Someplace there, you know, they just circled the south, you know, or whatever, and it, it might have happened, you know, and uh, so all these orbits you could see on the maps, you know, where and then they circled over Russia and they were over China, and like I said, our planes there, they they, they didn't even hesitate; they just came right out and told us if that capsule comes down in your territory, there'll be a C-130 within the, a couple of hours right there, and you don't touch it, you don't do anything, and you definitely don't touch the airplane coming in. And then if they could land, of course they would have, otherwise the paramedics would jump out and do their thing, you know, wouldn't need the flotation stuff, but, mm -hmm. but that was just a contingency because it was, you know, it was so primitive, you know, just that, well, you've seen the capsules, you know, and mm -hmm. it was, um, and if something malfunctioned or functioned too good, when they pushed the, one of them little jet streams on there, they either could go 2,000 miles out of the way one way or the other, you know. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. So that was, it was like I said, but that was just, there again, it was, it was a job. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know which ones I've met, I mean, I, because my flight orders don't show that, it just shows, you know. Mm -hmm. But that, and then... And it was to, partly to reassure, reassure them that you'd be there in a contingency, that's why the astronauts flew with you. Well, yeah, that, and, and just for their ideas. Yes. You know, because we were, we were cargo haulers, and we oh, got... I dropped thousands of paratroopers, you know, you drop 80 at a time, four or five a day, you know, loads a day, you drop a couple, 300, 400 a day sometimes. Mm -hmm. So we know how to drop, airdrop, and cargo, and different ways of doing it, low level, you know, so that wasn't the deal. The deal was you have to put these paramedics out in that capsule out in the middle of the ocean, and it didn't make any difference if, you know, the Army won't drop if it's over 10, 12 miles an hour wind. We put these guys out in gale winds, mm -hmm. these Air Force guys. They said, we can't pick a nice day. If it's windy, we can't say no, leave them, leave them float down there for a couple of days, you know. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they really practiced, and they were good. Mm -hmm. I was impressed with them. The paramedics? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Air Force. They were, they were like before the Green Berets or before any special forces. The Air, the Air Force had them in the 50s and mm -hmm. stuff. But um, one other short one. Um, when we left Yemen and we flew back, we back to um, or actually or Saudi Arabia, or Beirut. Well, we flew back to the States, so I picked up, I don't know, that's, that was maybe 30 hours of flying time, 30, 35 hours, whatever, Beirut back to the ZI. So they'd have a volunteer crew out over Christmas, and single guys would always sign up, so the married guys could be home with their wives and kids. And uh, so I signed up for it, and it was like the 5th of May. And they, the, the uh, run to Pakistan up to Peshawar, where Gary Powers, you know, the guy got shot down. The U-2 pilot. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we, that was the run that I have to get, get on, you know. And uh, not a very particularly a good run because you're in Turkey and Pakistan, but there was what the hell is wrong. And uh, so I couldn't even fly because I needed like 70 hours. And you can only fly 120 a month at 3.30 in three months. So I was pushing my 120 hours flying time with what, getting back to the States on the 1st of May and then with this thing for a round trip. And uh, 
So we get over there, and of course, back we spend the had to spend the night there again, the civilian clothes bit. Normally, we could stay at a pretty decent hotel in Karachi, but because it was Christmas Eve, we had to stay right in the embassy compound because you know the Marine guards and everything like this. Just because of this, there wasn't really any hostility, but you know, animosity. You didn't, you weren't an American walking around on a Christian holiday, or you know. So we run up to. Shawa the next day, Christmas Day, and uh, had a load, just a load of stuff. You had, you had food and you know vegetables, perishables, whatever you know. And uh, unloaded, and they said, "Hey, you've got a trailer over here." It was like about a 32 foot semi trailer. And uh, can you haul that? I said, well, "I don't know what. Why? Well, it's really important. You got to get out of here." So they talked to the pilot and the aircraft commander and he came over and he said, yeah, he said, Brian, he said, what do you think? Or BJ, they called me. I said, hey, what do you think? <clears throat> Can you haul that thing? I, so I went over and I was looking at it and there was an old master sergeant there by it and stuff. And I said, what's it? What is it? He said, I can't tell you what's in it. He said, but it has to get out of here because they're having trouble with the waters right there. And that, you know, that's where that real hard area in Pakistan is right now, where mm -hmm. all the troubles are and everything. And there was mm -hmm. troubles back there. And to, so there was an old CG marked down in a circle with an X in it, you know, with the center of gravity. So I said, well, is that pretty, is that accurate? He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, hey, listen, you want me to haul it, I have to know pretty close because when we're grossed out, I had a, even though the plane was big, it's touchy on, you know, this. And uh, he said, yeah, he said, well, he said, yeah, this is this probably weighed on both ends. I said, well, what's it weigh? There was like 22,000, 20, 22,000 pounds on it. He said, we probably added a couple, 3,000. I said, okay, I don't care what's in it. I said, you could have sugar in there. I don't care what's in it. But I do have to know if it's low, you know. So anyway, he said, yeah. I said, okay. I said, I can fly. I, said, I can haul it. So I said, we had a load of stuff. So we run this stuff back down to Karachi. And they'd ship it out of there and boat, you know, or something like that. Flew back up to Peshawar. And they had, they got roller conveyors from the mess hall, little dinky ones, and they had big heavy duty ones, and they had maintenance guys, and they had cooks because they don't have a load crew there, you know, it's just a, it was a spook, a spook base. They had the U2s and the RB57s and stuff there. All spy. All spy stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, we loaded it all up, and I got it right out, and Pida comes out, and hands me a can of beer. He said, how do you know for sure? Well, he already knew because we joked about this before. He put a can of beer right under the front crew door, and when that just barely touched the top, the plane was perfectly balanced. <laughs> <laughs> not, not copacetic, but you can fake it. And uh, so anyway, I did that, and then I had him jump up and down the back, the, all these guys, to get it to rock a little, see how it stabilized, you know. But what I didn't realize was the wheels. Then they, they put the wheels on the ramp, you know, that slopes up on the back of the plane. So anyway, I chained it down. I had all the 25,000 pound chains and we had, I mean, I could chain this. You could really chain stuff. So, pilot, he's back, he's back out there and I'm having a couple of these guys, they knew what I, they knew what they were doing, you know, I was doing it, but they were tying it down and everything. So he says, well, what do you think? I said, I'll sit in front of it. He said, if you sit in front of it, I'll fly it. I said, okay. <laughs> so we'd take off and we're just a little bit tail hair. Not, I mean, not, not bad. So when we got down to Karachi, I just moved it forward about two inches. That's all it took, you know. Swing it on into Germany, same damn thing again. You know, I thought about getting written up. And uh, we pulled in there and they just backed a 40 foot flatbed up to the back end. You know, I dropped the ramp on and they had a winch on it. And so they pulled the tires and they skidded this thing off. And there again, there's another one of these damn E8s, big, you know, from Washington. Wants to run over my manifest is. I didn't have one. What you waiting down? I said, well, this is pretty, this is about it. How do you know this is it? He's looking at this trailer. You know, spray painted. There's not. I mean, it, he knows it's not. It's not a current. You know. Anything. So then, if I didn't get written up again, <laughs> get back another letter from the whoever it was that was in charge of these five plane flights. You know, crew get another letter of them thanking us for the job done. You know. Mm. So that then I get promoted. The average staff sergeant made it in somewhere between seven and nine years. And I made it in a little over three. And wow. every time I got in trouble, I got promoted. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, well, because it's the, you know, we did stuff. It was a special, special request mission and broke the regulations, but 
helped yeah, out. Yeah, well, you had to, to do it because that was our job. You know, and our line pilots, we didn't have any trouble with our line pilots. You know, these guys are up, in, up to the 30, 32 years old. You get into maybe a colonel or something like that, he might be, he's looking at his back a little bit. He might want to cut it. But the other guy did, you went in, you wanted to load up, you didn't care what you were loading. Now load it, they'd fly it, you know, that was it. Now, did you ever speculate on what was in that trailer? No, just electronic gear, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Because they were still flying the U-2s, they either had been shot down already, but they were still flying the U-2s and the RB-57s. That was a B-57 they converted to. And these now you see these big 747 jet engines. At the time, the 707 engine, you know, was yay big. They had those engines and that were bigger than that window. Mm. On a beat on a U two and on these R B fifty sevens that they reconnaissance that's you know that they had converted to um fly reconnaissance missions. And the R B fifty seven would do almost as high as the U two. Mm. And uh but they'd take off from there and they'd have to fly south in Pakistan to get up to seventy thousand feet or so and then turn run over Russia and land over in Sweden. Mm. You know, and take pictures in the way mm -hmm. or something. But that was some of the stuff. There's a lot of routine stuff. Mm -hmm. A lot of work. A lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Different countries. Mm -hmm. Fifty some countries I get into. Well, you can see just yes. some of them enlisting in yes. around Bangkok, um, Tokyo. I got all stuff over there during Vietnam, you know, with engines and sparks and different things. Fun. Mm -hmm. Almost stayed in, but there was some conflicts and I didn't. F conflicts with. I had a home here and stuff, little things were going on and mm -hmm. yeah, I stayed in, I was staff sergeant and I had orders direct from headquarters, from Air Force, by Maine, they're going to ship the first squadron 130s over to Vietnam and I was already an instructor and there was another guy that just, he, he probably five, six years, he was just a little more than me and he would have been the NCOIC in charge and I would have been in charge of instructing and you know, that part of it training instruction. And as soon as I put my foot there, they had a written letter, a job call for master sergeants, both jobs. And the Air Force fills them with, can fill them with one rank less, you know, if they didn't have a master sergeant to do it at time. So they guaranteed me tech sergeant. So I would have been in the Air Force four and a half years and would have been tech sergeant. Mm. And hell, those guys retire with that, you know. Mm. But maybe I wouldn't have come out of Vietnam either. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. But that wasn't the reason I got out. It was mm -hmm. just, there was, Different things were going on at the time. So, about but what year d did you get out then? In the end of '64, the end of August '64. I just in the four years, just had two thousand hours flying time in that. And, oh, another, you know, a few other airplanes too. But. And when when you got out, wh where did you where did you come to then? Then I went to Grand Rapids. I said, stayed with one of my sisters. I thought I'd try a little college, and picked up a job. And. Uh, which was dumb. I was making about 500 with my flight pay from the Air Force. And I took a job for 100 a week when I got out. Mm. Then I went and I went driving truck with Richie. I drove there for seven years and no. was there at Dominion went on down, you know. Then I went to... R driving truck where now? Oh, just a laundry truck all over western Michigan. Okay. We had all the Kroger stores and all the Spartan stores under contract. And with, aprons and towels and... With Richie Gillespie? No, Richie O'Donnell. Richie O'Donnell, okay. And one of the drivers got hurt, and he knew I was looking for better pay, you know. And I'd always drive bonded anyway and stuff, and so I went there. Drove there for seven years. I got there, there was 32 drivers, and when I got laid off, they were down to, I think it was either 9 or 11. Mm -hmm. Because synthetic stuff came in. Synthetic smocks, table covers, restaurants quit using cloth napkins and cloth table covers and the fancy banquet covers and that was one of our main, that was our main business. And uh, as, they, as the guys retired, they just never filled them in and never did and never did, you know. And so seven years later, I, I was on that. Then I went to Steelcase a year and a half and got a, the big layoff there, 75 I think it was. What were you doing for Steelcase? I just worked the shipping department. Mm -hmm. I was in shipping and file, file shipping. Mm -hmm. and then I, when I left there, I got well, I laid off from there, and of course, the steel case always hauled, called back back then, you know, back in the 70s, and I couldn't get a job. I was working three 
jobs, two fifty an hour, is bartending on the weekends for the Anvets, because they wanted a guy there, you know, Friday and Saturday nights, mowing grass for another guy for two fifty an hour, and then I was working for Larry McDonough, janitor to work at the school. He was the treasurer in charge of Saint Alphonsus there. Oh, where was this at? Um, Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids, okay. So I was picking up a little money there. And then when I got done with the school, about seven, eight o'clock at night, I was painting apartment buildings till midnight, and then back up the next morning and go at it again. But you couldn't get a job. I was making like you know five fifty an hour at steel case, and you couldn't. Nobody's going to hire you because two weeks from now, steel case calls you back. You know? So the only place I get a job was to go to Spartan Warehouse. They paid a little more, <laughs> and it also had the seven years teamster. So then I just put my got my thirty, then in Spartan and retired from there. Mm -hmm. Built this shack and that was it. This house is out of styrofoam, by the way. I, when they're a steel case or a Spartan, that's the way they built it. everything there is out of styrofoam. So, steel case, did they call you back then? Yeah, but I was already in, in Spartan. Okay. And, and, uh, and how long did you work for Spartan? Eh, 24 years. 22, yeah. So you I lost a, I lost some time getting a hip replaced, and, you know, so I had a work a little bit longer than So you were off away from Beaver Island for a total of how long? Thirty five years probably. Thirty five years. And what brought you back here? Oh hell I never left. <laughs> never left. And all the vacations like these says all the vacations are up there. The other kids never got out of Michigan until after I don't know when they got old enough. I guess when they got married, my daughter went to Alaska and my son went to Well he's in Grand Rapids, yeah. He's He's got a good job. He worked a couple different jobs, but he's he's working at ACI now on Comcast. That's all the commercial installation, and uh, he's got about a dozen guys to work for him. See the trucks running all around. The daughter, she's a airplane mechanic, civilian mechanic for the National Guard in North Carolina. But she had to join the guards to do it, and then she still she picked up her pilot's license in high school. And then her A.M.P. license at Western, and went to Alaska and worked on float planes, DC sixes. First year there, she got laid off, so she was a head mechanic at a car wash. <laughs> <laughs> Next year, when she got laid off, then she went and flew and uh, I was working mechanic for these DC sixes, yeah. Air Alaska or something like that. The guy got a little four-engine piston plane. He flies down to Kodiak and did around out there and. Uh, she blew it there in a way, I think, because um, you know she's a mechanic, so she was working as a mechanic, and he found out. Of course, it's a small outfit, you know, just a dozen planes, and uh, he found out that she had a pilot's license, and he's also her engineer thing, you know. So and there's a panel, a regular panel that they, they fly, and that you know takes an engineer, not a flight mechanic. Flight mechanic is on the 130. I could fly it. Any crew member could handle the flight. Flight mechanic get drunk or something like that. I could handle it because all you did was flip a couple fuel switches, and there were some T-handles. You know, if you had a fire, you just pulled this handle. So that was, but if something happened on the ground, well then he's a mechanic, you know. But as far as the flying part of it. But anyway, she flew the panel for him, and then um, he said, oh, you got a pilot's license, yeah. Well, here, why don't you jump in the right seat? So anyway, he put her, he put her in the right seat on a couple trips, just, you know. And she, you handle the gear, you handle radio communications, you know. You'd, do some switching, stuff, you know, regular co-pilot. And uh, he said, hey, Cassie, he said, you stick with me. He said, you'll have your commercial, four-engine commercial in a year, which would have been, he was, anyway, you know. But this boodler she's married to, they took their motorcycles and shipped them to Anchorage, right down from Anchorage, you know, down to Seattle. Rode down through California with them and over through Reno, or, Vegas, I guess it was, and ran into a sleet storm in northern Arizona, and I, and I told her, I said, when we got to Seattle, I talked, I said, Renna, little you, Renna thing, put your bikes in there. Oh, no, Dad, this would be nice. It would be, you know, what the hell, young, you know. But when they ran into bad weather, they, they rented a, you ran it, <laughs> put the bikes in there and drove it to North Carolina. You know, for some reason or other, they wanted to go there. So she did good. She worked at IBM for a little while, and then she got into the, she got this job then that she wanted the mechanic, yeah. But now she's got her instrument rating. She's got her IA. Um, uh, 
she can sign off any airplane made or grounded. And she's right now she's just picking up her commercial license. Mm. But she's uh, she's flying a brand new diamond, a two hundred and eighty thousand dollar airplane, getting her instrument ready. You know, it's got the new flat screens, you know, mm. with the, the new instrument type stuff. Mm. It's funny she called her last year when she got it. She had she had a run to in the middle of the night and instrument time. Then she ran over to Myrtle Beach and over to Columbia, South Carolina. So she's coming into Columbia. The uh, controller, you know, it's nasty weather, and she's it is it was real it was real instrument time. It wasn't you know under the hood. She's in the so he calls to a, I don't know what it was seven thirty seven coming in behind her sort of in the whatever outfit it was you know Delta such and such or whatever he said he says uh, you want to slow down a little bit he says I got a girl with a diamond up ahead of you he says she's She's not quite your speed. And Kathy said, I damn near told him I could go that fast. <laughs> but, you know, she was the head of him, you know, coming in on this instrument approach. Mm -hmm. And she's ferried a couple airplanes and from, like, you know, North Carolina to Oklahoma and stuff like that. Just a little pickup. And you, know, you can see her picture up there. That's her. And the, uh, with her uniform on, and that's her next to it with the. Oh, yes, I. I didn't see that. I did 30 some pounds and, you know, mm. she likes it. And she said, I go to work for my hobby. Runs in the family then, came right down from here. Well, when did, when did you meet Dee then and where? And your I, wife? well, yeah, well, in Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids. Went to, had a flight to Chicago. I was doing some bill collect, commercial bill collecting and they had some kind of a convention going on around St. Patrick's time. And, uh, so the boss flew down. There was like a that was a big headquarters for the Western area, you know, the area like that. Grandma, I don't know, it was I was a I forget the initials now. Anyway, it was like a Dun & Brad, a commercial version of Dun & Brad. We did credit reports some places. They'd have a group, say all the plumbing and suppliers would meet once a month and they discuss this and you keep building habits. They, we had a note, we had a part of our outfit. Um, would liquidate or a place go bankrupt. We'd send the guy, we'd send our crew in to get him out of bankruptcy. A couple, three of them there. I remember one guy, we made him sell his airplane. Nice twin engine airplane. He had a, a hot secretary to balance that airplane right out. You know, got rid of the secretary, get rid of the airplane. And we gave him his groceries. He lived in East Grand Rapids. Made his house payment and gave him so much money for groceries, and that was it. <laughs> With the stipulation, he couldn't even build, go to the building for a year, mm -hmm. and we brought it brought it out of bankruptcy. And of course, all the creditors, because they're busy, you know, that's what we were. We tried to get our members their money back mm -hmm. instead of getting you know ten cents on the dollar, and they did. They got it right out. And that, but some of it was interesting. So, how did you and Dee meet? Well, I, that I flew. I went down. I flew down like on a Thursday, and then uh, caught you know the you know Friday and Saturday. And when I come back, of course, I picked up a case of booze or something. I had some Irish whiskey, and I knew that a bunch of the friends of ours were um, having a St. Patrick's Day party. So we flew in, I, so I grabbed the jug and went on over there, and she was making some salads or doing something like that. And she was looking pretty good, and one thing led to another, and that was it. <laughs> now, now she, just a little background on her, her connection with the island, her family? She knew some friends, that was it. Friends that she was at. Okay. Marie Garcia was married to, and she married a guy from here. And different people. Um, they all went to school. Some of these, these were the nurses that were having a party. Like Joy Green, you know, stuff. It was, well, she wasn't there, but there was the people that they graduated with, you know. Mm -hmm. There was a bunch of them that used to stick together, you know, get together like that. Lil Cole, Donald Cole's wife. Yeah. Um, Ellen Kuligalski, you know, she was one of them. Um, so was Dee a nurse too? No, okay. she was a sec secretary, executive secretary. But she she hung out with some Beaver Island, yeah. their nurses, and and that was her only connection. Yeah, had never been to the island. Okay. Well, then she went to Detroit. I was sparking her for about a year, but I wasn't looking for that ring yet. And of course, she went to Detroit. Well, then you know how they, then they started going down there. Well, then that changed. Her. <laughs> she had a good job at Alcoa, real good job. And she she was the uh, exec for Dada, um, Detroit area 
automobile association. You know, they're oh, they're auto. They must have a hundred dealers in there. You know. But she came back to Grand Rapids and got married, and that was it. Picked up a couple of part-time jobs, and then when the kids got got in high school, she didn't work when we were first met for well, till after they were in high school, and uh, and she started out with a part-time. You know, but the kids were working part-time. They both went to Catholic St. John Vianney and Catholic Central, and. Work janitor, work over at school, and different things, you know. No problem. They're good workers. A few gray hairs, but that happens. <laughs> they didn't get in jail. <laughs> so they're both there. So, hey, if they're doing good and I'm doing good, and, and they come back here. But we came up here all every summer. Hell, we rented you know, the hill there at Archie's, you know, uh, at Archie's places there. We rented there for 30 years. Cause even though I had some property up where Runberg is, and then I bought, sold it up to him, and then I bought this. But um, what year did you buy this property? And let's see, we built in '98, so I probably bought it in '94, maybe. So when you say you never left the island, no, you... I always like back. I made every. I went something like 28 St. Patrick's Day. I never missed one. Oh wow! You never missed a funeral or a wedding or you know, vacations, and we worked four day weeks at Spartan. So you could switch. You work Sunday to Wednesday one week and Tuesday to Friday the next or something like that. So you had to pop a four day weekend, you know, you could shoot up here pretty easy. Now how did, how did your, your bride like Beaver Island when she, you first brought her out here? Mm -hmm. She liked it. Yeah. And you get to get to know the people because you know we're around all of Janet and both my sisters lived in Grand Rapids there. Janet O'Donnell and who else? Eleanor um, McDonough. Eleanor McDonough. She's got the place in Charlotte right now. Her husband died a couple of years ago, so she's got her parents' old house over there. So what what was the island like like back then when you when you when you came back? Um, you rented it first, right? Oh yeah, I rented it for years. It still it was okay. It was good. A little more, a little busier, like you say all the time. But you still, and you know more people now. Of course, I'm getting no more of them up there in the hill up at the cemetery than <laughs> I'd like to admit. <laughs> but uh, no, we still, like I say, we got four of us, nine of us graduated in '59, having their fiftieth little party here in July. And uh, who were those? Four nine? of us. Four of us live here. Who are those yeah. nine that graduated together? Okay, well, Eleanor Mooney, Ladonis' wife, and Beverly Cantwell now, you know, with Walt, you know, that's Richie's sister, by the way, you know, the farm man. And myself, and Loretta Laffin here, Loretta Slater. All four of us live here. Then we have Caroline Kamlavikis. She was Johnny Paul's sister, next one under Johnny, her in, you know, in her class. And Jeannie laughing here, live next to where Archie laughing his place is. And Sally Martin, she would be Margie Martin, Margie up at the the old convent there. Be Little Ernie's aunt. And um, let's see who Jeannie and Sally and Caroline. Oh, Gary McDonough. His mother just died, but he lives in Florida. He, he retired from GM. He's down there. So I pretty much retired. Caroline, she married a real nice guy. He was the. Well, he started off as a mechanic for the school district, just the county, just south of Traverse City. And God, he was running it years and years ago. You know, he was the the head guy running the. You know. He knew stuff, he knew engines, knew, you know, nice guy. So that worked out good. Now they spend their, I think they spend their summers over there someplace. And they get back here once in a while. They got a, something in Florida. So the whole bunch is pretty, you know, worked pretty good. Sally's got this damn um, Hodgkin's Korea stuff. You know, it's in that family a bit. Nasty, nice girl. She could ice skate, she was a good ice skater. Do the fancy stuff, you know. 
Mm -hmm. We skated out one time. I think it was um, Kenny and Gary and myself. February. And when it was uh, just like I was just had one of them two week old or week old ice, you know, where it froze, be sick. And we went out after school. And we're, it was we're, cold. we're out in the out of the just ice skating out towards Harbor? Like, uh, yeah, like towards Grace Reef. Oh. Or not Grace Reef, towards um, Skelly Lake. And uh, we got out there and beautiful. Just and it was just like shotguns going off with the ice cracking, you know, when it's freezing that when it's, you know, like zero. And of course they're probably sixteen years old. I mean, what the hell? And uh we all skates and we weren't experts, but we all were, we started skating, you know. Now you never see a kid out here. Sunday afternoon nobody knows how to skate. But anyway, they all watching them damn T V or stuff. But um we get out there and finally one of us had enough brains, I don't know who. I ain't gonna take the credit because we looked around and here the island was just a little bit of a smudge like this. <laughs> and the mainland looks like from here to Garden Island, you know. So one of us had enough brains to say maybe we better, you know, we got good sharp skates and like that. I mean, and not a, there wasn't a drop of snow or nothing. It was just like skating on a groomed rink, you know, except for the pressure to sort of crash. And one of us finally had enough brains to turn around and come back. <laughs> now you were 16 when you... Probably about, yeah. So you you kept you've kept pretty close. You expect to see all nine of them one. Uh, well, Ed and Kenny, uh, you know, Kenny died in Texas. The guy that was in the Navy and okay. the other guy, he died from cancer in Texas here a couple of years ago. Okay, and Good that's friend. that's your whole. That was probably the whole graduating class. Oh then, yeah, right. Yeah. Back in the freshman year, I was the only the only boy. Gary was in the seminary, and Kenny was a grade ahead of us, so I was the only boy. So. Mm -hmm. What other exploits did you have together with that group? Uh, well, when the Bradley went down, I flew with a guy named Don Hanson. He was a pilot flew oil people from Alma down to Texas and around. He's coming here all the time. He had a nice 180, Cessna 180. And the first day the Bradley went down, we listened to it all that night on tra we had a Transoceanic. In fact, I got the radio in the basement now. Hmm. Um, every year, the guy that owned Zenith, started Zenith, coming here with his yacht, of course it was a fish dock. And him and my grandfather become really good friends from like 1920s or 30s, whenever they started. Every time Zenith made a new radio, come with a different model, he gave him a free, when he came up in the summer, he gave him a new one. There was Zenith radios with their eyes and everything all over. And I got the last one, um, it says, made expressly for and stolen from Jim Gallagher, James Gallagher, <laughs> that's my grandfather's name. But, no zine, you know, but anyway, we listened to it all night. We could hear them the search and stuff. And another uncle of mine, Jack Copen's a Charlotte boy. He's going to have his 90th birthday here this fall. He was the exec on the Sundu. And when the call came in, he just took off with the Sundu. He, he took the Sundu out with a half a crew. Mm. And the indicator, you know, that tells when it's rolling, it was pegging at both sides. And the engine, I've been on the, in the basement of one of them, I found, you know, they have different settings. It's a, they're, you know, they're diesel electric, and you can go up to like 10, it's wide open, and then you can push a button and get it up to like 12. They went out like that, emergency, emergency power all the way to Gull Island, you know. Wow. And uh, those gales, you know, nasty. But then, like I said, next day I flew with Don, and they plowed the the runway and just about started at the corner, you know, Pudgino corner, because just a grass one, up to about where's the runway to that part of it, you know, and uh, there's just slush and a dip. And we took in, uh, as we're getting close to it. The Bradley? No, no, to the, we, we searched oh. all the islands. We spent that first day all just flying around the island, looking for the islands, you know. So we're coming into land, of course it was slushy. He touches the brakes, his right brake is froze up, no brake. So he's doing this with the 180, you know, tail dragger, and you can see he's going to bend his prop or do something, you know, didn't want to do something. So he says, oh, okay, hang on, Brian, and we're getting about from here to the, well, the water, whatever it is. And he just hit the rudder the other way, goosed it, and set the one brake like that, flipped it, made a ground loop, flipped it right around and goosed it, and we literally backed up and stopped like that. I thought that was some pretty cool flying. Wow. 
But I used to fly all the time with Joe with us on skis. We'd run over to the other end, we'd check and see how the, you know, always in the airplanes when they're, because we hold all the mail, the freight from the airplane. So I was in there, and he'd, he'd have two loads to do. I'd jump in with him and I'd handle the plane when I was 12 years old on the way back to Charlevoix or something. So I did get interested in the Air Force stuff, I guess, like that. Were you would actually handle the plane at 12 years? Oh, yeah, so you just flip it over into 195, you know, it's a crossover. Mm-hmm. You want to take a run? Yeah, okay, I'm not good, I'm sure, but. He just, but then the next day we took Johnny Paw, had a uh, Model A pickup. We all have Model A's, I told you this the other day, but not all of us, but six, seven of us had Model A's. So we went over, the, they were pregnant in the bodies over the Coast Guard station, so we went over there and picked up a map and, uh, and Kenny, with us, Kenny McDonald, the guy that died in Texas, he was, you know, but anyway, um, we jumped in Donegal Bay and went up to Iron Ore Bay on the beach with the map and we find something, we just mark it, you know, because they're trying to get a drift pattern for the bodies or survivors. Mm-hmm. And uh, then they come back, you know, and drop it off over. But all those guys that come in, the bodies that were getting around the fetal position. Oh, really? And the guy, the two guys survived. One guy lived between Charlotte and Petoskey. Dad knew him quite well. He said they started off with more than that on the raft. It just wasn't a, not a you know, floating type thing. But it was so nice, it was just a nasty night, you can imagine. And the water felt warm to him, which it would, you know, the water was, what, 35 degrees and the air was, you know, 15 with sleep. They said, I'm just going to get in here and get warm. And that'd be it, drift right away. Mm. So two of them did hang on and wow. survived, you know, out of the... But we could hear them when they were breaking up, and we could hear the whole. We could listen all that night to the Transoceanic after supper, you know, just on the channel. What, could you he, hear the radio of the car, yeah. Bradley, before they went down? Uh huh. Radioed in. She's breaking away or bending away. I forget what it was. They said there was a, you know, whatever. And when you flew, away. flew out with, who was the pilot again that you flew oh, out? Don Hanson. Don yeah. Hanson. Yeah. When you flew out, the goal of that flight was what? We flew all the islands, all the shores. Sure, all, all around the shore. So look for the survivors? For survivors or anything that would you know, be anything. Mm-hmm. And I was, what, 16 at the time? 17, maybe. 16, 17. Did, did you know at that time the location of where the Bradley was? Approximate. Okay. And did you find anything in that flight? No. No, not that I remember. No. Mm-hmm. Of course, the, the thing that I remember most was that landing. I thought that was, that was absolutely great. Yes, <laughs> frozen break and 180. And, and the one, yeah, and then that's running out of runway, you know. And, and like you said, he didn't want to bend the prop, you know. Bend whatever you're going to bend. Now the next day, well, I don't know if it was the next day or not, but you mentioned that the body started washing. Well, that first, yeah, even that first day they were picking some up. Did and you? The second day when we went over the Coast Guard station, yeah, they had the, they had the boats, they brought in the boats, you know, smaller boats and the 40 footer and stuff. And there might have even been some private boats, I'm not sure, I don't remember, but they, they were consolidating at the Coast Guard station anyway. I see. But they were bringing the bodies in, you could see them bringing them in, you know, and they, mm-hmm. like I say, they'd be in the fetal position, you know. Mm. For what? I don't think they got them all, I, I don't know how many there was, but there was enough mm-hmm. that, you know, this is what this is what they went into, obviously, when they froze to death, or when they drowned and froze to death, they're both, their combination, mm-hmm. I imagine. Mm-hmm. That's bad, because the hell, I think oh, about two of them were from Rogers City, you know. They left, you know, 50, 60 kids and rah, rah, rah stuff, you know, I mean, it was the uh, same as the Fitzgerald, you know, that's, mm-hmm. but wasn't anybody from the island here mm-hmm. on it, but they had a lot of sailors from the island. Ma was telling me one time, I forget how many cousins she had that were captains on the ore boats, but that's when there was, you know, 70 ore boats. You go up in the evening time and watch them go up Sand Bay. They all did the same speed. They all burned coal in the 50s. And there'd be just, there was nothing to see. A, a dozen, well, one right after the other, line right up. They all had the same speed, you know, and just heading for, you know, Grays Reef there. And uh, during the day, the same thing. But at night, it's like, or just in the evening. In the day, you see the smoke, but at night, you see the lights, you know, going back. Mm-hmm. And when you went across on the mail boat, you always, you know, we're passing in front of one or behind one, mm-hmm. heading down to Chicago, you know, coming back up. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but there was an awful lot of guys. We, and we, when we put up ice here, our whole crew pretty much would be, you know, we'd have, they had to have eight, ten guys down there, you know. They all were sailors that were just be home for the winter. You know, they lay the boats up the first of December and go back in March, you know. Unless the guy had the lucked out to get the job for the winter, staying on the boat, you know, just sort of keep an eye on things. But like I said, Ray Call, Claire Call's husband, he always ran what we called the Jack. That was we had, we had a movable thing to when you put the ice up in the ice house, you know, the ramp there and everything. But you walked alongside and it was just a little plank. I don't know. Why. So you would pull the um, ice up, these ice cakes, up to the foot of the thing. And uh, then they had a team of horses, some guy driving a team. I'd say one of the guys that maybe, I don't know who it would be, Don Burke, one of the sailors, you know, something like that, he'd have a team. And uh, then they used a team to pull these, pull probably four of these blocks, three, four of these blocks up. Well, Ray would be the guy behind him with this, what they called a jack. He made a, like a two by 12 plank with a bunch of spikes through it and then had a big handle, you know, to guide the, they you know, come behind him. You'll keep on skidding it up, and then there'll be two, three guys up in the ice house itself. You have these big ice tongs, you know, skid it around, and then they jam them right tight together. So it's like one solid block of ice, probably 15 feet high. Well, there's a picture of the ice house right there. Mm. And we, they put it right up to the eaves. So you can see it, you can imagine how much, how many tons and tons of ice would be in there, these 500 pound cakes. And that, that was to supply the whole island all summer? Um, yeah, well, in the, in the 40s, there was, you know, probably most of 90% of them, and there wasn't that many refrigerators in. And in the 50s, you got more, but the people still, the old refrigerators, they weren't much size to them or anything. And even if they, the people got one, they still had their old ice boxes, so they still delivered a lot of ice. Mm -hmm. They delivered every day, pretty much. Who, who did now? Dad. Okay. And he knew everybody's size of every ice box. Yeah. Mm. One day he might be going around the harbor, the next day he'd be, you know, out of different places. And of course, there wasn't anything out here then, but um, the brothers, they'd take a couple hundred pounds every day, a couple wash tubs. One would be full of the pop and stuff, and the other one the, the cooks would use for the lettuce and... The Christian brothers? Yeah. Okay. And... Uh, what, what, tell... The talk, hotel. Talk a little bit about the Christian brothers at that time. What, what were they like and... What, oh, real, real nice, friendly guys. They come here, there'd be two batches, I think 40 at a time, maybe. 40 rings a bell. And then there was, they had a German uh, guy and his wife were the cook, cooks. They lived in that little house around the corner. And um, there was one brother that would be here, one one or two that would be here like all summer. Do you recall their names stuff. or? Uh, not really. Okay. And, uh, but they'd go, they'd play ball. Baseball. And yeah. And they'd go for walks after supper every night, walking down the middle of the road with their habits on. And then Larry McDonough was just getting into the um, riding stable thing. And they'd, they'd, they had a, I don't know how they had six, eight horses. You know, that was one of the things they'd do. That was their record they'd take and they'd rent the horses. They'd, one day they'd be, uh, the brothers would be back and forth with them. And, uh, they just seemed like a real pleasant bunch. They they never preached or they didn't do anything like that. They were just they were friendly, more friendly, you know. And uh, they were all teachers out of uh, Chicago, you know. What is it, some Jesuit college or house, something down there, whatever. Or not Jesuit, but the, you know. But we'd, we'd always haul them, pick up their luggage with, with the hay truck. And they'd do that. And same as the, like when um, Boy Scouts would come. You'd load all the gear in the truck and take it up to Fox Lake or mm -hmm. into that little road into by Barney's Lake. Mm -hmm. You know, it's fenced off now, but you know, down there. So, so the brothers would come here. They were teaching at the colleges down in Chicago. Their right. time here was was, that was for what? Their, that was their retreat, okay. recreation, get out of Dodge for thirty days. Okay. So they were, were they here just during this the, the summer? This was a retreat house. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nobody was here in the winter at all. Okay. Everybody, the clock leave and everything. Do they interact much with the uh, town people, or? Oh yeah, they're, just, yeah, they're very they're friendly with a lot of different people. <laughs> we got to know them. I could say I can't remember any names now. They, they'd be wrong they, because they had their free time. I mean, they had their retreat stuff and their prayer types times and their whatever they would have. 
But, you know, they'd be meandering around the dock or, you know, Dick's Store or whatever. They'd, and then the, and in the evening, I think they might have had a prayer time in the evening because then they'd have their, they'd have like a habit or a, you know, surplus or a cassock or something like that. And uh, they'd like walk to the, after their meal, they'd walk to the Coast Guard station and back and then they'd disappear. Mm -hmm. Back probably for some kind of a prayers or something, I don't know what the hell they did. Any inter interesting stories about them, uh, incidents or anything? Mm, not really, as I can think of. Mm -hmm. Talk to, say, Loretta, she would know. Loretta Slater, she was, because they were right at the end of the road there, you know. Mm -hmm. they, she would know who the ones were, I think. Mm -hmm. She was a little more religious than me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm trying to think who else would have been around at that time that Mm -hmm. Donald Cole would be familiar. Mm -hmm. um, so, so your high school high school graduating group. What what other things did you do with that that group? Those those. I'm not going to put it on tape. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, the things we set school records. We we had them cancel. You know, we used to get a group from Lake Leland or Gaylord come, you know, and we go over there and. Like you do graduating. They came here, so of course we thought we'd just entertain them. So we did. And they got back to the Gaylord and found out and about three days later that the nun gets a letter from the nun that was the principal over there and she never wanted to see us or ever hear Reaver Island again. <laughs> and all we did is run the show. They had Lloyd's cabins up there, you know, a bunch of the cabins like that. And of course the chaperones were in one and the kids are in running like this, so Gary and I and a couple of them, we just showed up, you know, we might have had a, some refreshments for them and that, and <laughs> till about five in the morning, you know, <laughs> and then the poor kids get out on the boat, and, and Dad is running the boat over Charlotte at the time, so he's a manager there, you know, so I had to go over for some reason or other, I forget what the, what the reason was, so, hell, it was rougher than hell. So I just called the airplane, I flew, you know, I wasn't going to take the boat. So I get over there, gets cleaned up, everything, and, because uh, I hadn't had much sleep either, but, you know, and, because uh, you had to haul them all down. Now you got them all partied up in there, you know, then we had to you, take and haul them down to the boat. You were hauling who down The now? students that we were partying with all night. Okay. You know? no, no, so. Your your high school class was hauling what students now? The students that, from Gaylord that were over here to, you know, to, that you went back and forth to visit like that, you know. Oh. So they, uh, so then we get, I get to Charlotte where because I'm down at the dock, you know, the old man is catching the line and stuff. I'm looking up and here they are, and they are green, you know, something. They know that, <laughs> and some thought it was the greatest thing ever happened. <laughs> I saw, I used to run into a couple of them over in Gaylord that were selling the cattle sale. Because if you get a restaurant there, you know, of course, they're working in the restaurants and stuff like that. It was, a uh, yeah, I thought I was in love with this one, but she was pretty rich, so that didn't help any. It's <laughs> for the night, but yeah, we'd have a dance, you know, mm -hmm. food and a dance, and, and then, of course, it got carried away a little bit after that. So. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, it didn't, I mean, there's not, no harm, nothing done, no. nothing like that. No. It was just innocent. Mm -hmm. We thought it was just normal innocent stuff, I mean, what the hell. Mm -hmm. What uh, about the the music, speaking of the dance, who played music at that time around here? Uh, it would have been Jewel Gillespie and Pat Boner and Walter McCauley, um, maybe Robert Palmer, Edward's brother, or, or Russell, one of, the, you know, one of the Palmer guys or something. Um, there's a lot of people, they all, a lot of them can make music. It's family type stuff, you know, I mean, they knew Jules, um, Rita, Mary's mother, she, and Mary can sing, Mary Palmer, if you could ever get her to sing. And Richie Gillespie's a good singer. If you ever get him to sing. He used to, you know, 20 years ago, him and Rich Scripps, I forget about the name they had, how they played, and Richie could sing as good as anybody you ever heard. But Jules' wife, she could sing too, she was a real good singer. What kind of music? Were they it's just the regular stuff that you hear on the tapes, you know, the country type or whatever you want to call them. Were there were any anybody left that actually did any step dance? Mm -hmm. Well, the Doney guys were just buried Peter Doney's uh, wife here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, my uncle, Uncle Joe, 
Barry, or Gallagher, and Uncle John, he lived right where Kay Messini is. He was, he was a big guy, you know, like, not quite like me, but a you know, big guy. And uh, he was as light on his feet as you could. You couldn't imagine a guy that size could be as light on his feet and step dance. Mm. Uh, the Donny guys, of course, Peter and Patsy, they used to all, uh, always try to do it. Now, Patsy, Peter, and Patsy worked for me. Best worker I had. But Peter and Lester would, you know, they get up to, the two of them get up trying to outdo the other guy. Mm -hmm. A little friendly rivalry, mm -hmm. which was good. But could you describe like a uh, typical party night or something where they'd play, be playing yeah, music? Yeah, they played the music. They had the chairs sitting all around the hall, outside. The no, parish hall? Yeah, we didn't have any table set up unless it was a dinner or a wedding, a wedding you know. So here you are, you're out there, you're trying to dance, and you got everybody in the island, all these old women standing there watching you, you know, so you're not really doing too much dancing. Jack Call had set up a table right outside there, right around the corner by Mercedes. And uh, have a keg of beer out there. And uh, because it wasn't, the bar wasn't in the, in fact, the kitchen is where the bar is now. And where the kitchen is, was the high school. Because that's what they used, you know, the, there at the parish hall. Right? Yeah. Okay. And then when they finally quit using the path, then they made that into a little library too. Like in 1960, when they first started to put the other stuff on. So they 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 wouldn't have any alcohol in the parish hall. They'd have it, the cake sitting on a table outside. Yeah, just a table thing there. And and, and then so continue with that scene. Well, that'd be it. And they just play the music and outside. Some, there's some good waltz or people could waltz, but you know, back some of the older people I remember. Square dances. I could. I even knew how to square dance, and uh, not good <laughs> by any means. But you know that was one of the things that you did. And uh, there'd be somebody I forget who called the square dances. Uncle John did. I don't know Uncle John would call the square dance. That'd be you know Kay's grandfather. Uncle John last name. Uncle John Gallagher. Right? Gallagher. Yeah. And Barry, what? Barry. <laughs> Power. Okay, and and the step dancing would they be dan who would be playing to, to for the step dance? Oh, that'd be you know Jewel and Pat, and they just liven it up, you know, Turkey in the Straw or something like that. Whatever okay. They'd be Remember any other songs that they'd play or? No, but everybody, the whole family, would be there. So you play things like that went on. The family would be there till well, maybe then you shift to the little ones home. But the families were involved in all that kind of stuff. The get the Gillespie. Get -togethers. No, no, I meant, um, say you had three kids, you know, mm -hmm. you went with your three kids, uh, might one fall asleep, is three years old, and the other find you, you know, they run them home or something like that. I see. It wouldn't be just, Adults. you'd have to be 18 to go in oh, here. Okay, It'd be the whole family. Sure. Which would be, you know, pretty neat. Yeah, that's gr great. Otherwise... Yeah. Like I say, another day, it was a good time, a good time going up here. Like I say, we're running Model A's, you're riding horses, skiing behind the horses, skiing behind the Model A's, whatever, or cars. Mm -hmm. Sliding down the hill, you don't even see they, After, as soon as supper time hit, Jewel put out a set of saw horses up by the church, and then up by the museum. And you see the road, you know, it gets in the winter, packed down, and you know, and you'd be sliding down hill there till 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> Kids don't even know what a sleigh looks like, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, sliding down like where the rectory is, there where the, yeah, where the, um, actually there was a tennis court where the rectory, where the, uh, con where the re church is. But you'd be sliding down like where the rectory is and medical center, you know, just uh, what the hell are your kids, you know, you, that was a big hill then. And we go up where the tower is in Mount Pisca, you know, go down there too, but that's when you're older. Mm -hmm down there in a homemade toboggan and kill yourself. <laughs> well, I want to ask, what was old Patrick Bonner like? Nice, pleasant fellow. Little broke. Um, he had a little had broke. one eye. He had a little broke, huh? Yeah, one eye. Had a little, yeah, different accent, you know, and everything. And a lot of the guys did. And uh, I don't know what's going on. Okay, we got these seagulls are swarming all over. Must be some kitty dance coming in or something. <laughs> But the, uh, no, he was nice, just nice, regular, pleasant guy. He had the farm up there. And 
Otherwise, uh, was he the only fiddler at that time, or? Yeah. Um, I don't know. The King's Train might have done a little fiddling, but I can't think of anything right now. Um, anyway, yeah, he pretty much. I think he pretty much. And Jewel played the guitar, and the uh, he played the steel to the the Hawaiian guitar. Okay. He played that really good. You know the way you run the thing up. And Walter McCauley, he was just out of school, maybe sailing a little bit at the time, or going to college. Uh, and yeah, no, it was just whoever it was. There never to, seemed to be any shortage of people. And what could what, play? There was, there was somebody played an accordion. I can't remember who that was. What did Walk, Walter McCauley play? Guitar. Guitar. Did he sing? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Who were the singers? Um, well, Rita was one of them. And uh, Rita, Joel's wife. Okay. You know Mary's mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure. Oh, well, Lorraine would get up. You know, Ever's mother. You know, she'd get up and do the the tap dance thing and all this kind of stuff. That'd be just that'd be entertaining more than um, being a singer, as far as with the band. Mm -hmm. I, think it, I think it was pretty much music. Mm -hmm. No, no. Mm -hmm. It'd be in and out, you know, and I don't know. I don't know if you, you recall this story. There was a story about one night Jules wanting more power for the the band and Oh yeah. And blacking out part of the town. Do you, oh yeah, oh yeah, he did that. You know that was yeah. that a common thing or No. I mean it was common to shut down like half the island. And the, the engines, they'd be blowing black coal. 